How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to Borlai Hobby Time. We're back in the wild imaginary west this week with another monstrous animal encounter. After unboxing this riverboat model kit, I laid out all of the pieces to see what I had to work with. The kit is well made, the construction is pretty straightforward, and the crew that came with the boat are as follows. We have a man with a bugle, who I'm assuming is the captain, a mime, and a bodybuilder zombie. When I opened up the instruction manual, I just found that I couldn't put it down. It was a real page turner. I began removing parts from their sprues and assembled as I went. This riverboat model is far easier to put together than the smaller version of the same boat that I used in my Mississippi River Monster diorama. This kit was made to work with a motor that you can buy separately to run the machinery at the back of the boat, causing the paddle wheel to spin. I'm going to be permanently sealing this boat in resin, so unfortunately we won't be able to include that rotation feature. But here's a quick shot of it spinning for your enjoyment. After getting the wheel in place, I began assembling the rest of the ship, starting with the main deck and the two boilers. In the wild imaginary west, people still use steam power, but you'll often see it in tandem with electricity and four stalls to prevent monster attacks. Not everyone in this universe uses those technologies, however. There is a distinct difference between the east and the west in this universe, the physical boundary of which being the mighty Mississippi River. The sides are not at war, but in the developed eastern states where no monsters are, the U.S. government strictly enforces bans on the use of Edison's ideas and inventions, while out west, enforcing the law is nearly impossible due to the dangers that exist. Because of this, outlaws, trappers, cowboys, miners, and the like have developed the tech to suit their own needs, and many inventors and tinkerers, not being satisfied with the capabilities of steam, have traveled out west to be free to further develop the technology themselves. All that being said, this steam-powered boat usually spends its time in the river systems of the southeast far away from monsters. I'll explain how they got into the dangerous waters in a minute. After the boat was done, it was time to figure out the monster portion of this diorama. I found this nice long wooden frame at the hobby store and I thought it would be a perfect base, the right size and shape for a giant snake to be slithering through the murky water underneath the boat. I traced out the shape of the boat unnecessarily, then I broke out a pasta roller to begin conditioning the clay to sculpt the snake. After rolling out the clay, to make it easier to work with, I grabbed a sheet of parchment paper so I could transfer it without the fear of messing it up and also limit the chance of it sticking to the surface that I was working with it on. Luckily for me, I remembered learning how to sculpt a snake with Play-Doh when I was four, and I used that same technique to get the perfect snake shape with this clay. After dividing the snake in half, I followed that up by slicing it long ways to create two snake pieces that were round on one side and flat on the other. I then formed those pieces into the curves that I was looking for, and I refined the shape using some sculpting tools and additional layers of snake skin. At first I considered making this more of a sea serpent rather than a snake and I gave it a protruding spine, which I eventually went back and I flattened out. I added some ribs and other textures to the side using some ball styluses, and then for some realistic looking scale texture, I used this mesh material that I picked up from the fabric section. After pressing that into the surface of the whole snake, it was time to make the head. I decided it would be fitting to make this snake an anaconda because anacondas tend to be nearly this big anyways. I used some smaller ball styluses to add some details to the face, including the nostrils, the mouth, some tiny eyes, which I added eyeballs to off camera. I textured it with that same mesh material, and then when it was done, I added it to the body. I dry fit the snake into position next to the boat to make sure that the whole thing fit right, which it did. So I took the snake to the oven to bake. After 20 minutes, at 275 degrees Fahrenheit, the snake was nice and firm, so I took it and the boat outside to prime. After that, it was time to start painting. I started by painting the snake, and I used a photo of an anaconda as my reference for this anaconda. I used an airbrush to do most of the painting, which helps create the nice soft transitions from color to color. When I was done, the overspray that was left on the paper made kind of a nice piece of artwork. 
I switched to a brush to finish off the detail work including the eyes and the unique coloration of the scale patterns on the head and down the side of the snake. And once it was done, it was time to paint up the boat. I masked off a section at the bottom that I wanted to stay that nice dark gray base color, and then I added a pre-shade using black. While I paint this boat, it's a good time to thank all of my patrons and continue the story of this diorama. Like I was explaining earlier, this riverboat should never have found itself close enough to the Mississippi to warrant the use of a forestall. This particular trip, however, called for a delivery of goods to Mobile, which is close but still outside the border of Monster Country. Recently, the captain of this ship has made some unwise beverage decisions, and because of that, he got off course, missing the entrance to Mobile Bay, sailing straight on toward New Orleans, the incredibly well-fortified city at the mouth of the Mississippi. It was nighttime at this point, and he realized he may have gone too far, so the captain decided to pull into a small side channel, not knowing where he was, and put down anchor till the morning. Once the base colors were all on, I broke out an oil wash made from burnt umber oil paint and mineral spirits. I covered the whole ship thoroughly, and I left it overnight to dry. After the wash had fully dried, it was time to remove some of it using more of those mineral spirits and some cotton buds. This stuff does say 100% pure and odorless, but I don't think it's potable, so probably don't drink it. After soaking the cotton buds in the 100% pure odorless mineral spirits, I removed the brown tint from all of the areas that I wanted to return to their lighter color, mainly focusing on the white areas. I followed that up with some stippled on chipped white paint, and then after that, the painting was done. With the boat and the snake done, the next big step was to add the lighting. But first, I needed to add the acrylic windows that came with the set that I left off until this point. I carefully added those using some plastic cement. To get the windows to have a nice soft diffused glow, I used this light diffusing window film from Woodland Scenics. After gluing a piece of film behind each of the windows, I began prepping everything for the install of the lights. I drilled a few holes, and then I soldered my filaments into a funny shape which will help get light to everywhere that it needs to be. Earlier off camera, I added a piece of styrene to the front half of this section to keep light leak from pouring onto the lower deck. I used whatever method this is to make sure that just the smallest amount of this filament was up inside the bridge. After soldering all of the lights to a switch and then to the battery housing, I put the ship together and I was sure to test my circuit all along the way to make sure that it worked. After hiding the switch under a barrel, it was time to move on to the base. First thing to do was to take the base outside and prime it, then I brought it back in and I added a layer of dark greenish blue. The purpose of this step was to add a nice base color underneath the water that would hopefully give it some depth. When that was dry, the time had come to glue the boat and the snake down to the base. To make sure that none of the paint comes off of the base, the snake or the boat while they sit in the curing resin, I took the whole thing outside and I gave it a protective layer of matte varnish. Once that was dry, I sealed the interior edges of the wooden frame with UV resin to keep it from leaking, and it was time for the big resin pour. And in case of any leaks or other similar disasters, I decided to put my old hobby mat underneath. I broke out my two-part shallow pour epoxy resin, I measured out part one, and I added and mixed my pigments. I then poured in part two, and I mixed it all together, pouring back and forth between mixing vessels to make sure that everything was blended thoroughly. After that, I filled up the wooden base. I popped all the bubbles as they formed with the butane creme brulee torch, and in case you're wondering what I did with all of the leftover resin, I poured it into some molds, which I will use in future projects. After 72 hours, my resin had cured, and it was time for the finishing touches. The first one being the duckweed all along the shore of the still channel that the captain foolishly decided to anchor in. I used the same technique for the duckweed that I used in my alligator attack diorama from earlier this year, because I really wanted an excuse to use this technique again.
With all of the little green dots dotted, it was time to prep our foolish riverboat captain. Like I mentioned, he got into this situation because of some unwise beverage decisions, so I replaced his bugle with a bottle, and after a quick zenithal prime, it was time to paint. After anchoring his boat, the captain stepped outside to get some fresh air and step away from his crew, and he got a little too close to the edge. He knew he hadn't gone far enough to be in giant alligator territory, and the water here was far too shallow for giant catfish. He didn't realize how close he was to the mouth of the Mississippi, however, and forgot about the other dangers that lurked in the swamps. In his current state, he failed to notice the large dark eyes peering up at him from the water below. The last thing to do was to paint the sides of the diorama with black 4.0, and after that, I called it good. I'm a rolling stone, bound to roam, come the morning, or I'll be gone. That is it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Huge shout out as always to my patrons. You guys are the best. Have an awesome week, everyone. I'll see you next time.